know. <laughs> just, okay. It definitely doesn't mean what it used to mean. <laughs> <laughs> we are not in Copenhagen. <laughs> yeah, oh boy. That's also a good start. <laughs> I was driving home through the plane to Cabin. Can I go by? Turn it over to you for your pleasure and how you'd like sure. to introduce your team. And Absolutely. Uh, well, we've, we've set up the format this year as, uh, as we have in, uh, in all the other years, so there's opportunity for every department to spend some time with you. Uh, this evening we have the IT or MIS department, school and library. Uh, we've also, at uh, the chairman's suggestion, added a item four on this agenda, uh, which would be kind of a general budget discussion. <coughs> so should you get through your your agenda early this evening and, or want to take some extra time, that's an opportunity to kind of freelance it a bit further if you want or maybe prioritize future meeting discussion items, those sorts of things. Uh, so if it pleases you, we could jump right in and start walking through. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Jen Lim is here on behalf of the IT department. Yep. It will be a good segue because a fair amount of her responsibilities deal with the school side. So it will be a good opportunity to kind of transition into the school discussion. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me in to uh, present the budget to you. Um, I, in the interest of time, because I know I only have a half an hour, and you know how I like to talk about technology, I could take a couple of hours, but um, in the interest of keeping it down, I thought I just would give a very brief overview of kind of how the department stands today, um, and then talk about just a couple of our key highlights that um, are represented in our budget this year. Um, as you know, the IT department is a shared services group, so we have eight employees that service about 17 locations. Uh, we have nearly 4,500 students and staff that we service on a daily basis, and at this point there's roughly 6,500 different devices that we um, maintain and service. <clears throat> the budget for us is split into four major categories. We have administration, networking and telecom, hardware and software, and online services. This year, <clears throat> we're realizing a total increase of 2.3% over last year's budget, and that's primarily due to anticipated and planned and negotiated increases in contracted services. So by that, I mean uh, software and hardware maintenance contracts. Typically, when we negotiate a contract, um, we'll look at between a 3 and 5% increase on an annual basis, so uh, we've actually managed to keep those costs relatively low. <clears throat> so highlights from um, next year's budget, which is on page 28. That's tab 4, page 28. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Just a few of the things that you'll, you'll see an increase in the software budget for um, that are going to be deployed in the coming year. One is called C Click Fix, and uh, it is a, we initially rolled it out to facilitate Public Works internal um, vehicle maintenance ticketing systems with other municipalities. <laughs> so basically, it was a way through the new core system of City Works to enable other municipalities that we are working with um, and servicing their vehicles for them to remotely submit vehicle maintenance tickets. They also have a public facing piece of this application. So that's what we're going to be working on in the coming year and um, that was a, an increase in the, the subscription costs but I think it's going to be worth it for the citizens. Basically what this application will do is um, create a way for our citizens to better communicate with us and to report problems so they can report anything from they see trash on the beach or they see a loose animal or they see a pothole. They can actually use an app right on their phone or they can log into it on their home computer, report the issue, and then also within that application they'll be able to see if the issue has been reported by somebody else. If it has, they can vote a thumbs up for it. 
Um, they can take a picture of the problem and send it in directly so um, the folks back here can actually see what they're talking about. It also has GPS mapping services so that we can pinpoint basically where they are when they're reporting the problem so there's sort of no discrepancies in exactly where the pothole is or where the trash is. Um, so we are working, it's, it's for, I should say, it's for non-emergency services only. We're working with um, all of the other departments right now to try to create a list of different issues that potentially would be reported on by citizens. <clears throat> There's a lot of other uh, cities and municipalities around the country that already um, employ this method, Portland being one of them, and so we are sort of learning from Portland about you know what kind of categories they have and, and how this works. But I think it's going to create some transparency for, for our citizens. How, how much do you think that is? I'll do that next year. Um, the entire amount is roughly $20,000, but that includes the um, vehicle maintenance piece, and we had to pay for some customized integration into city works. But it was really the only way that we could give these other municipalities external access into our system. I think we'll really see great advantage from a customer service point of view. Uh, those people, those that I know that have used it on a personal level, really like it. It's, it's very easy uh, to check on the status of, of things. And um, I'm really looking forward. We're going to do, a, a, I think, a, a big PR campaign when we roll this out to make sure people know it's there and really encourage them to use it. I think one of the big benefits to the town will be that there's um, very, very detailed reporting that you can pull from this application on the back end. So, um, you know, when we come to you next year, we should have quantifiable results um, with regards to what was reported and um, how we responded to it. Uh, the next up is Google G Suite for the town. So our um, Exchange, Microsoft Exchange system has hit end of life. It hit end of life in uh, January of 2015. So we have been looking for um, some kind of cloud-based services, primarily to alleviate the internal strain on our systems, but also to reduce overhead costs and um, increase security and redundancy without adding additional hardware or um, overhead on our side. And then also just to help out with our mobility issues and remote access. So we have been looking at Office 365 and Google G Suite, <clears throat> and we opted to go with Google G Suite because over a four-year term, it's going to save us roughly $50,000 over Office 365. <clears throat> we will um, be able to do certain plugins, which will help people with the transition because it will enable them to um, keep their front-facing client of Outlook it's what they're used to in terms of mail and calendar um, functions. And then we'll um, help them to transition all of their files over to G Suite as well so that instead of having to be logged into our system on our network to gain access to these files and forms and, and um, you know, anything else, um, they can basically access it from any machine anywhere at any time. <coughs> and is that, is that town and school going to that or is it just town? School has already migrated to Google. Okay. We took them to Google over about a two-year period about a year ago. Okay. So we started them off um, moving all of their files over. We do do um, secure files. So we basically encrypt everything before um, it will in transit and at rest. Um, and then we migrated everything to Gmail. So they're 100% Google now. And so I always tell the folks of the town it's not our first rodeo. We have taken 500 people to it, so you know we'll we'll find a way to make this a hopefully relatively painless transition. And this should allow us to share documents a lot easier than we do now. If yes. budget documents, is, for example, we can just put everything on Google Docs, let's say, or something, and pull it down instead of having to right. format and manage yeah. things like that. Okay. Or or VPN into a system. And the the, the beautiful okay. thing about Google too is that. It allows for online, real-time collaboration between a lot of people, too. And you also have version tracking. So if a lot of people are in there and they're changing the document, you can kind of flip back through all the versions. And if you want to restore a version, you can do that as well. But we'll help them to migrate over all their contacts and their you know, existing mail and all their documents and everything. Okay. And I would say the time frame we're shooting for end of calendar year for that, it may take a little longer just depending. There's, 
There's some other add-on pieces that we need to take care of, like uh, workflows for documents and uh, the connectivity with our um, telecom system. Are there any other software implications that we have to worry about now shifting to Google, that existing programming that we have that has to either be replaced or? We've already addressed that. We've done okay. some functional requirement sessions with the different departments. And um, for example, SharePoint is something that um, we're fairly rooted in. So when I mentioned workflow, document workflows, that's something that we're looking at a third party piece of software to take care of, mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. us with. Mm -hmm. um, Google has changed dramatically over the past couple of years though, so they um, will soon be allowing for things like team sites and there's, there's a lot that will actually um, be equivalent to what we have now. Okay. Um, third is disaster recovery business continuity. So one of my goals coming into this position uh, four years ago was to um, draft a comprehensive disaster recovery business continuity plan for the town and the school. So basically to try to take a look at the systems that we have placed, the hardware, the software, the databases, the end users, and figure out should a disaster hit us or we had some kind of disruption of service, how would we recover um, and recover quickly. So we drafted a plan and while we were working on this, we did find a few areas for improvement. One of them, we're going to partner with um, school facilities and we'll put in a redundant, a, a co-location facility, basically cells of here. So that's going to require racking, wiring, cabling, fiber connectivity. Um, the school facilities budget will pick up the redundant power source. So I feel confident that that's, that's going to be a real plus for us. I'll be able to sleep better at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, those costs are reflected in our CIP budget, which is on page three of the CIP section. And then last but not least, we have to do a switch replacement that's going to happen down at Public Works. Um, we upgraded our um, core switch here in this building to 10 gigabit and Public Works right now is the only outlier in terms of not being able to function at 10 gigabits. So we, we will replace that. It's an aging device anyway. We would have to replace it regardless. So that's also reflected in the CIP budget. The CIP is uh, tab six, page three, mm -hmm. under uh, equipment. So I'm assuming um, that all of what you need um, is really reflective in each of the other department's CIP budget and not placed in yours because yours is limited to $20,000, is that right? Um, anything that we are doing district-wide yeah. or town-wide is reflected in our budget. In your budget? Yeah, uh, for technology-wise. Yes. Yep. The difference is uh, two of the four highlights that Jen mentioned, Secret Tricks and Google, are, are really shown in the operational side of the budget, yeah. whereas the other okay. two yeah. items are in the capital. Okay. Um, so, any other questions? Um, I just had a question on page, well, in our budget book, it's page 31, but you talk about <coughs> budget drivers, software, move email, document storage to cloud-based system. Is that what you were just talking yeah. about with the Google? Yeah. So There's it, licensing associated with that. Yeah. And so what's, so the, the C-click fix was, was a new program, a new enhancement that was mm -hmm. about 20. What's, what's the all-in for this Google enhancement? That's actually not itemized out in your book, but all in the annual total for Google with something called AO Docs, which is going to assist us with the workflow piece that I mentioned. Um, it's about 36.6 a year. With, with the labor and every, with the apparel that you need to support and everything else? Is that um, we can do the labor ourselves because we've already done it on the school side, so we pretty much know how to migrate everything over, um, integrate our Active Directory, all of that. Um, if we were to go with Office 365, there is consulting. There's about, um, I think it was $25,000 in consulting fees that we would have to pay because that we're not as familiar with. Mm. And if we were to go with Office 365, we would have to build a hybrid model 
um, for archiving purposes on this end. So we'd still have to retain our exchange system here and also have it out in the cloud and have it basically syncing online real time all the time. Because I think what we're trying to tease out or will be for this whole process is, this is, a, as you know, a challenging budget year, and really trying to tease out what are sort of just the delivery of current services and what does that cost versus the investments in new programming or new services and is this the year in time? So are these two things are directly, what are the consequences if these were pushed a period of time, the, the, two, the two major things that you have? Well, the exchange system hit end of life in January of 2015, so the consequence could be we lose email completely. And what about C-Click? C-Click fix, um, we have negotiated a reduced rate with them for the first year, so essentially, Moving into it last year through July of this year, um, we had a dramatically reduced rate. I can't remember off the top of my head what that was, but it was basically a fraction of what it actually usually costs. <clears throat> Moving forward, it's roughly $20,000 per year for um, subscription fees. But a portion of that, I'll remind you, is has to be paid anyway to enable that vehicle maintenance ticketing system to work through our core system in Public Works. So you'd be probably paying, you know, half of that anyway. So we do recover at least those portion of the the expense through the revenues um, with that system. We've factored in those costs in our hourly rate that we charge out. Yeah, we consolidate all of the software costs for all of the departments in technology, in the technology budget. So any kind of um, revenues that are realized are usually realized on the side of the department, and we realize the actual costs of what it takes to maintain the, the software or the hardware. So you're saying that 20 is offset by 20 of revenue? It's not 20. I would say probably half of that. The portion of it that is in place to service and support this, uh, the, the vendor system that we have in place, uh, those costs are incorporated into the hourly rate we charge. We are talking about an enhancement to turn this out publicly facing, so there's arguably another $10,000 that we do not need to advance, but we really see there to be great value in terms of enhanced customer service by doing so. But that would be a component that could <coughs> push the public facing. It could. There's no reason, no business reason we have to. Uh, okay. that fair? Um, there there is a contract that's signed for an annual, on an annual basis. So the contract that we signed was last year. I can't off the top of my head remember what the exact term date is, but we are contracted at the reduced rate because of the vehicle maintenance piece. We, we, have, to, we have to do this for the vehicle maintenance piece anyway. So yes, there's a portion that's public facing that we could potentially not deploy but there's a piece that we already have deployed. It's right. live with other towns now. Is there anything in this software that's not related to Public Works? In C Click Fix? Yeah. Yes, the public facing piece is not entirely related to Public Works. The reason I ask that is because if we're receiving the revenue in the Public Works side of things, but where our costs are in IT, right. I'd like to know. It's easier for us to see what the, you know, the gazintas and the gazatas are if it's all in one cost center, if we will. But if there's other, there's other departments that are utilizing this. What percentage of that? They're not utilizing it yet. But when right. it turns public facing, depending yeah. on the nature of the complaint, uh, it could be rooted to the police department or community services. So, uh, but there'll be no revenue offset. That's clearly a, an enhancement opportunity we're providing to the public. I understand that, but we talked about vehicle maintenance tickets for like Old Orchard mm -hmm. Beach or somebody where they could generate their own tickets for us, correct? Correct. So I would assume that some of that revenue, when we mentioned before, the revenue we receive for doing that built into our hourly rate, which you said, will yes. offset some of those costs. Yes. It's just, it's sometimes difficult to discern sure. that because we're looking at public works revenue side of things and that looks True. very positive, but we see the expenditure on IT side and that we've, we've got to make sure well, we connect we've, those we've dots. tried very hard to centralize all of hardware software, you, it used to be kind of sprinkled all throughout, and so we've tried very hard to kind of bring it all centralized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some things that don't fit perfectly under that model, but I think in the big picture, it's best to show all these technology-related expenses in one place rather than across all departments. The, the reason for that being <clears throat> we track the licenses 
So, I mean, not necessarily in this particular application, but in other applications, we have the ability to go in through a management console and track all of the licenses. How many are in use? Are they concurrent licenses? I typically am the one that negotiates all the contracts. So I take a look at things like indemnification and liability and information security, all that kind of stuff that usually other other departments don't really want to do, mm -hmm. um, and and you know can't shouldn't do. have to do. Yeah. So do. that's why we sort of consolidate a lot of those contracts and thus the licensing costs under IP. I understand. I don't have a problem with that from a management standpoint. I just want to make sure from an accounting standpoint that we know what those offsets are. So that, again, looking at public works budget, they tend to be fairly even, if you will, mm -hmm. like neutral. Um, and that could be a little bit deceiving if they're receiving revenue, but we're using that revenue to offset something in another department. So I just want to be clear Fair that point. when we're looking at the cost of this system, we understand what that revenue offset would be. I don't expect it to pay for the whole thing, but if we're going to talk about taking some of that, Fair you know, I'd like to see what that can happen. Yeah, I think moving do. forward, we probably could work with public works to actually assign a number yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that we spent a considerable amount of time talking to other towns. We went to the user group conference, spoke with other towns. Their, their city, Detroit, uses this. Um, city of Portland uses this. There's a lot of other towns and cities. And w without fail, every single one there said this has been a real added benefit for the citizens of that municipality, town, city. <coughs> And I think for us, what we've heard time and time again from the people here through surveys and just general feedback is communication is really one of the top priorities for us, for the town. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason why, you know, when we, when we employed this to begin with for public works, it made sense to move forward with it for public facing for our citizens. Just another quick question. On your total payroll is up about 5%. It looks like there's some, how much of that are the summer positions that you've, I mean, it's about a $37,000 increase. Yeah. But you have some summer positions that are um, temporary? Our, we did add an additional summer position, yes. Um, so instead of four, we'll, we'll have five people this summer. The reason for that being with the uh, main learning technology initiative, so the MLTI program, um, I, I'm not sure, I know Chris was at the, um, at the, the school board workshop. Um, that program is completely changing. So instead of having the state basically hand us devices, mm -hmm. they're going to, they've created a grant program. So we have to go out and acquire the devices, image the devices, clean the devices, assign the devices, inventory the devices, deploy the devices, um, and they are going to reimburse us through a three-year term of a grant pro <coughs> program. So that's added about another 850 devices that we now are going to be responsible for on, you know, staff side. So all told, we're, you know, cleaning, imaging, deploying, collecting, assigning, inventorying, maintaining, fixing um, about 3,200 laptops and Chromebooks town-wide. So instead of asking for an additional full-time employee, we are trying to make do with, basically we hire students in the summer. So we have five of them for a short period of time. They do come in, we do have some extra money built into the budget. Um, we do have them come in over vacation periods and help us out with different projects. Um, frequently, we'll have to go back out to carts of laptops, inventory them, clean them up, you know, re-image as needed. So, um, and this might be actually for Tom uh, more so than, than you, Jen. Um, I'm looking at the, so if we're looking at your total numbers on page 27, and we look at exhibit three on page five in the, in the back end, we see the split of cost sharing versus uh, town versus school. Yeah. Is it this number uh, on the initial front page and it's simply just divided by this amount and billed accordingly or is the number that we're seeing just municipal side and the school's budget will have a separate line item that accounts for that 67% of your actual cost? Is you know what I'm trying to say? Jen spent a lot of time to, to come up with that apportionment so I'll, yeah. let, I'll let her respond. So um, what you're referring to I think is... 
is big five of tab nine. Nine, yep. yep. And then there's a split. I guess maybe maybe an easier question, Jen, would be: Is is what we see in front of us in your section the total IT budget for the town, including the cost for the schools, or is this just the municipal portion of it, and the, the school department has an IT section that represents your needs for them? The school, yes. So the way that this works is that we represent the entire amount, and then the school actually um, credits us. Okay. Does a, a journal transfer, basically. I think I'm saying that. Right. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, so it just says a journal transfer. And the way that we um, have sort of apportioned out what the school um, owes back over to the town side is about four years ago, we implemented a help desk ticketing system. So I go through all of those on a pretty regular basis to come up with um, percentages of how the staff time is spent, where the task staff time is spent, um, and those tickets aren't necessarily 100% reflective of how much time is spent. There could be a ticket that takes five minutes and there could be a ticket that takes a year. So I'll go through them and kind of, you know, there are some quantitative things that we can do and then there's some qualitative pieces to it too. So I kind of, you know, bring those together and figure out it's, you know, roughly a, I think it's like a 30-70 split. Right. So, so then, the, then the numbers that we're seeing in the, in the Technology Information Services Department section are your total budget numbers for your department, and then whatever's reflected in the school budget is their portion of that value. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. It's transferred and over. just put a, a, a number to it, the reimbursement amount from the school to the town for these services is projected for this budget as 505425 That's in tab three under revenues, page two. At the bottom of the page, it's a single number. So management information system. Right? Yes. We probably need to clean up our acronyms here. We used oh, to call yeah. it MIS. Uh, it's now IT. So back in Exhibit Three, so it. Have this in. Nine. Nine. Okay. So um, Exhibit Three. This says page five. If you take a look at that, that shows how the IT staff, staff salary and benefits are allocated. We're allocated for fiscal year 17. So you can see that the school takes 67% and the town takes 33%. And then above that, you can see the division of the help desk tickets. So it's not exactly equivalent because, as I said, the tickets aren't entirely representative of the amount of time each project takes. I'm good. Okay. I'm good, sir. Okay. Um, one thing as we transition into the schools that um, Tom and Kate wanted me to mention is we have worked, as I mentioned multiple times in the past, we have been working to move our um, CIP, a, a sort of a chunk of our CIP budget into our operating funds on the school side. Um, and I have sort of a, a, a list here, it went from fiscal year 14, we had roughly 655,000 in CIP and 36,000 in operating, to this year in fiscal eight, year 18, we'll have about 230 in CIP and 350 in operating. The reason for that, and you'll kind of see that shift when you take a look at our CIP um, five-year projections, the reason for that shift is because we were trying to be a little more accurate in how we accounted for the cost of what I would what I would consider consumables. So your laptops, um, your dock cameras, things that probably have a shelf life of five years or less. Anything that has a longer lifespan, so for example, carts, um, projectors, um, you know, Eno boards, things things that are going to, you know, are large and are probably a 10-year lifespan, those are going to remain in um, CIP. So cabling, router switches, that kind of stuff too. So the hardware though, the devices are, there's a four-year refresh cycle, correct? There is. We are trying to squeeze five years out. 
So then the, the question I guess I would have is, is that four-year cycle now because of the time duration, is that still in CIP or is that moved to operational? No, the, any time we replace um, end user devices, that's, we've tried to move that into operational. Yeah. Okay. So if four or five years, we'll still try to move it into the operating budget. Do you have a, a, a ballpark of what that generally is every year? I, I know it will vary from depending on what level we're at, but um, can you give me just a general idea of annually what that typical device replacement cost is? For the entire refresh, yeah. so the refresh including device replacements, um, projectors, carts, cabling, dock cams, any peripherals, any, anything that we need. We typically budget about 500000 um, This year, because we will be able to go with Chromebooks, it's going to cost us roughly 350000 A portion of that, we have found out, we will get back from the state of Maine. So I just was at a meeting this afternoon where somebody from the DOE confirmed that we will receive $200 per seat per year for a three-year term. So we will have to pay the upfront costs, and then we will fill out grant applications each year to recoup that. The $200. Mm -hmm. How much is it per unit before the $200 comes back? Is it $350 and we're covering $150? <laughs> price of, so we're looking at the Lenovo and 24s, and the base price on that is 225 with a $25 seat charge for Google. So it's roughly 250 um, And then there's some other things that we'll have to add on. So we'll have to get them bags. Um, there's some uh, security software that we'll have to put on there and, and some other things. So all in, it's roughly 331 per. And that's guaranteed? Unlike regular educational funding, we're going to be guaranteed funds from the state? Yeah. Uh, I hate to ever say that any yeah, right. from right. the state is guaranteed, so I think it's going to be guaranteed this year. Yeah. But, but that's okay. only for the middle school, correct? So how many devices only, are we talking about? It's only about? for 7th and 8th grade. Okay. Only it does not cover 6th grade. grade. So how many devices roughly are we talking about? That? About, um, I think it's 474, 475. Um, but then another roughly 101 in staff units. And we get credit for those also, right? And we'll get credit for those. Those are going to be slightly more expensive units because mm -hmm. there's a full-fledged laptop. Where does that reimbursement at 200 per unit per device, where's, where's, where will that re revenue be seen? And will it be realized this year? Mm -hmm. well, this so. this yeah, we, I literally sure, just... I found this out three hours ago. So. It's not reflected anything right now as revenue. No, but That's it, why I'd like to it will it, so. be. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. We can't write the check yet. from the state, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, That's still changing, too. I should, I mean, I'll, I'll qualify that by saying that the parameters of those grant applications are still changing, so there's a lot of rumors mm -hmm. about, there's even rumors from the DOE about which way that's going to go. So that's why we opted to just put the money in the budget to make sure that we had the devices there and then whatever money we get back from the state is a plus. And I just want to also clarify one thing we clarified at the school budget discussion. Um, we already did a lot of the infrastructure requirements for this too, right, because the state was paying for certain infrastructure at the middle school level. They've since retracted all that, and but we were a little forward thinking and did that ahead of time. Is that fair? Yeah, so the state um, used to, through MLTI, provide the infrastructure for the wireless network at the middle school. And we had experienced a lot of problems with that network anyway, um, and we tried to work with the company that the state had employed to do the work, um, and we just couldn't come to any resolution. So over the summer, we basically ripped out the state network and put our own network in, which helped us regardless because it was much more beneficial for the staff and students at the middle school to be in an all-inclusive network campus-wide as opposed to sort of an outlier. They were having some issues being the outlier. So it helped us, and then we got word um, in the fall, basically, that the state was not going to be mm -hmm. supporting networks anymore. So we were proactive, and that's a positive We thing. were proactive. Okay. I think it ended up saving us a lot of money, actually, in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so we switched to school.
school, come on up. Um, you'll find the school under tab eight. And then, of course, the narrative can be found in tab 10 at the end of that, if you'd like that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Which seat's hot? That's what I want to know. This one's warm. Yeah. <laughs> As usual, I'm carrying a lot of paper. So, um, would you like me to give me? I'll take care of that. Yeah. Let's just cut to the chase, Kate. What's the good news? <laughs> there is good news. There is good news. Excellent. Good news. I love it. And, and Heck, we're guaranteed reimbursement from the state for our computers. That's the well good that's, news. Well, that's pretty good too. <laughs> um, I'm I'm not holding my breath on that one. Yeah. But I do have one that I I can hold my breath on. I don't have to or whatever is the right way to approach. <laughs> Let out a sigh of relief. Thank you, Tom. All right, so I think everyone has a, a sheet of paper in front of them. There's more around them to go out into the audience, I think. Uh, what we thought we'd do is just um, give you sort of a a working doc here, the sheet that has a lot of green on it for money at the top um, is describing the budget that we proposed and that the um, town council and school board passed the first week of April. The good news, as Chris says, is in the second little block which says changes since first reading. And the exciting news there is that Anthem rates came in last Friday and for some wonderful reason, we received a 1.21% increase. Peter's shaking his head because we had talked about this. Yeah. It was like, you know, I was, I was very concerned about budgeting 5.5%. Last year, our increase was 8.81%. So it's been pretty volatile, but what's happened um, in a nutshell is that Anthem has changed their system with the MEA Benefits Trust, and instead of giving basically a flat rate increase to all members of the trust, in the past couple of years, they've been using individual experience for individual school districts, prior year experience to influence the um, tier that you land in for your premium increase. So this means really good news for us, but really bad news for, for other for folks. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I actually I was saying to Julie, my, my list sort of kind of blew up with all of the business managers across the state going, what did you get, what did you get? And, it's everything from 10% to zero. And so we're on the right side of that, thank God. So um, part of previous contracts were restructuring the health care benefits to be um, provided for the individual only, and if, if another spouse has access to other health insurance, they have to take that. Yes. Is that still in effect? And if it has, are we realizing, have we maximized the benefit, so to speak, from that implementation, or do we foresee well, I, I thank you for bringing it up. It's not something that we've been talking about a lot, but um, essentially um, what's happened is that in every collective bargaining agreement that we've negotiated since that first one with the teachers the, three years ago or four years ago now, uh, we've incorporated that same language which says that if your spouse is eligible for health insurance coverage from an employer, um, you know, other, another resource, that it doesn't say the legal language isn't we won't take them because we'll still take them, but the board will not pay anything towards their coverage. We'll pay for a percentage of the employee and the employee's children, but if the spouse has eligibility for coverage elsewhere, we ask them to go and sign up there. And if they'd like to come on board, we, they can certainly pay full freight, but that's not very affordable. So in the first year, we determined that that was going to be a change of about $300,000, a reduction in what it would have been if those same people had continued to have family coverage from one year to the next. And, um, you know, if you think about it, every year those same people, if they had still carried family coverage, would still be costing us 300000 plus all of the rate increases that we've had in the interim. So it does continue to be um, a good savings for us, and I think that the 
the board and the union at the time, the four years ago, uh, were recognizing the difficulty of keeping up with those benefit increases and uh, <coughs> made a concerted effort to make that work for everybody. So that does continue to be a saving. Um, so if you look at changes since first reading, the good news is that our budget can be reduced by $207,000 just based on the fact that the anthem rates that we're projecting no longer have to be projected at that higher level. Um, there's also a small increase, uh, a small change in Delta premiums. Delta Dental came in because they were, um, I don't know, they were trying to look even more fabulous than anthem. They gave us a rate decrease of 1.2%. And in that case, we had budgeted 3% increase. Uh, so again, good news there, obviously not in the, in the same order of magnitude because dental insurance, we don't pay very much for that as it is. Um, the third element in the changes since first reading is our property casualty auto insurance. I don't actually have the policies, so those will be coming up in a little bit, but our insurance agents contacted me and said that they'd been doing some work with the underwriters and that they were able to refine their estimates and lower them a little bit for us. So all told, since we had our first reading, we've got a $239,000 reduction in our budget request, and that's reflected on the flip side. Um, there's also an impact, small impact in adult education and school nutrition because, again, those folks have benefits, and they were budgeted at the 5.5% increase. So not as significant, perhaps, but um, it's there all the same. And uh, in that pink column, <coughs> what you're looking at is the new version of the school's base request with those changes made. There's a lot of numbers there, but essentially you've got three chunks, general fund operating budget at the top row, the expenditure budget, some offsetting revenues, and the net tax request, and then the same thing for adult ed and the same thing for school nutrition. So you can just see the change from first reading to where we're standing right right now. And if you flip over back to page one again, I've got one more little section that says that we have <coughs> items still in motion. I've got a meeting with our insurance agents on the 26th and they're hoping to get me some good work comp estimates. And that also is, is it's payroll driven and it's budgeted with a guess as to where we're gonna land. So I don't know if I can go three for three here and, and get a reduction there, but that's what I'm hopeful. Um, the other two items that I put in there that are sort of under our radar right now is the, the ongoing negotiations with the bus drivers bargaining unit and the support staff, education support staff bargaining unit. As they go along in the, in the negotiation process, it may be possible for us to sort of refine the estimates that we've made based on you know, where they're landing in their conversations. I'm not sure how helpful that will be because of the timeline of the negotiations, but it's out there. And the third thing that I had noted was our kindergarten enrollment. And we're still sort of trying to find out how many kiddos we're going to have and how many teachers we're gonna need in the, in the kindergarten realm. So, so not, to, not to try and box you in, of course, but can you give me a range a dollar value from zero being no impact because nothing changes to maximum impact if everything aligns the way we want it to. What what scale are we looking at here in terms of the impact on the overall budget? I mean, are we talking tens of thousands of dollars? Are we talking hundreds of thousands? Are you speaking of the, the items still in motion? Yes. Um, I would say on the negotiations front, um, it, we might be talking $50,000. It's not a, a, an enormous amount. Um, but that's, you know, depending on the percentage this way or, or that way mm -hmm. in terms of what we've projected. Um, kindergarten enrollment, I guess what you could, you could sort of value that in terms of a teacher, which would be, plus you know, or minus a teacher. plus or minus a teacher, which would be sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 And uh, the work comp is, um, that's a little bit scarier, it's more like the anthem where there's a lot of volatility um, and it's all dependent on your experience rate and, uh, and how happy Memic is feeling with us at any given moment. Um, so that could be, you know, that could be 100,000. But again, that's, that's really, um, like you said, you're boxing me and I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a very small box. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get you to do a gutch. I'm just trying to get a perspective of on course. Yeah, you know, what's, what's in motion and right. What's, yeah, I mean, are we talking yeah. millions or are we talking right. ten grand? And, right. and yeah, it's it's not millions, but it's a couple of things that we're keeping our eyes on. And you'll add the laptop issue that was brought up earlier to follow-up. Well, yeah, I just, follow up um, I just made a note because our last yeah. conversation, uh, Jen was not really confident that we were actually going to have access to those funds necessarily. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she did say that um, with the, whatever the nature of that grant application is and what we're so fearful of is the same thing that, that you guys alluded to is that why would the state give Scarborough money for that when they don't feel mm -hmm. like giving Scarborough money for anything else? So is it going to be need-based? Is it going to be, is there any um, sort of financial um, calculation in the same way that EPS is calculated that's going to take us out of the running for that? So I'll, call, I'll uh, yeah, check in with Jen and see if we can, I mean, if we could plug in an offsetting revenue number, as Tom said, it would make us very happy. I thought it was just a block grant type of situation where you either qualified or you didn't, right? I mean, I don't think it's not like you can get $100 instead of 200 I thought you, and pretty much the, for the first year, they, I, I mean, from what we had talked about at the leadership meeting, it sounded like it was going to be you qualify because we've, that's how we're going to distribute the funding short term. Now, whether that stays, I don't right. know, but. And you know, um, that it's determined that it's needs based. Right. So then it could be a percentage based on the percentage of free and reduced lunch students that you have, like okay. many of the block grants are. But okay. Well, and, and the qualifying parameters, too. It's, there's like two pages of qualifying parameters that we have. Okay. The, uh, the other concern, of course, would be does the state actually have the money to fund this in every district? I'll answer that. Yes, they do. It's whether or not they want to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> On the nose. <laughs> yeah. But simple math, in terms of your point of order of magnitude, I thought I heard it would be as much, many as 575 devices that potentially could Times be eligible. $200. Times 200 dollars. And $115,000. If the, uh, now I'm going to look over my shoulder at poor John again. Did, are, are we thinking that that would actually be coming to us in fiscal 18, or would that be we spend it in 18 and <coughs> then we get it in 19, the way that EPS works? Uh, well, we will spend it and we'll get some of it in 18 and some of it in 19 and some of it in 20. But the 200 per device is slated for fiscal 18 as revenue. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So the 115,000 approximately is over three years, not per year? No, it's per year. It's per, per year. Oh, okay. 200 per device per year for three yeah. years okay. is yeah. what right. the way they laid it out. Uh, but there's... Uh, uh, disbursement is probably whatever, yeah. I get it. Yeah, I, I hesitate to really sort of make any yeah. promises or put anything in ink right. because, you know, we had somebody from the DOE at the meeting today who said things. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's really a grant application itself, right. so, uh, you know. No, I get it. I, get I get would it. be shocked. So it's fresh news. We'll have to certainly monitor we'll that closely that's and that's report back to you. Yeah, we yeah in terms of items still in motion, it definitely <coughs> belongs on that list. Yeah. Thank you. So what should we talk about next? Well, so I, I don't know how, I, I know that Chris was there for our full day workshop and then into the evening and Peter was there for part of that time and I'm sure you all have watched the recording of it so I don't <laughs> want to be redundant. I'm happy to ask or to answer any questions that you might have specific to our budget or just talk generally, whatever you prefer. This handout appears to do a very good job of kind of isolating and, and focusing on some key pieces. I wonder if that might be a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is the, the work that I've been really talking a lot about in terms of this budget on the green side. Um, shows you the realignment of existing resources. So I think that there's um, a lot of really innovative things that are happening within this budget that are getting us um, closer to meeting our goals and ensuring that we're on a continuous improvement cycle without um, going to the taxpayers and asking for a ton of new investments. And so um, on, this, on this side, I'll just kind of walk through each of the realigned resources. Um, and then answer any questions that you have as we go. But in the primary schools, one of the things that we are planning to do is to bring back our third uh, primary school principal. 
you may remember that uh, three years ago there was the talk of do we need to close one of our primary schools because enrollment was starting to decline a little um, and an assistant principal was brought in to support. So we had two, uh, two principals and one assistant principal that were supporting all three schools. Um, so Ann, Principal Ann Lovejoy uh, full-time supports eight corners. Um, and then Kelly Mullen Martin, Principal Kelly Mullen Martin, and Assistant Principal Ann Cass work as a team and support both Pleasant Hill and Blue Point. Um, one of the things I was hearing very early on as I transitioned into the district from, from uh, parents, staff, um, and, uh, and the leadership team was that this was a temporary model that needed to have a fix. And this was an opportunity I felt with the retirement of ANCAS for us to reassess the needs of those three buildings and also to think about um, not just how do we solve this K-2 solution, but how do we how do we use this opportunity to um, realign resources across our, our organization to increase efficiency and effectiveness? And so what we have done is um, posted uh, or planned for the, a plan to bring back a K-2 principal that will become the principal of Pleasant Hill, which is our smallest of the three primary schools. There's currently 174 students enrolled at Pleasant Hill. Um, but they'll also have K-2 cross-building phase level responsibilities in terms of enhancing our data culture and ensuring that we are making evidence-based decisions both um, daily in the classroom with our instructional plans, but then also um, across the board when it comes to professional development and programmatic changes and shifts as well. Uh, this is a position that I think is absolutely critical it's, an, uh, it's a gap that I recognized in my transition. We just, we have lots of anecdotal evidence. We have lots of you know, qualitative eminence, if you will, about the good work that we're doing. Um, but I really think it's essential for us to be effective. Uh, we must have some really rock solid metrics that we can refer to and that we can use to celebrate our incremental successes while also using that to strategically plan um, for our future and ensuring that we're using our resources to their maximum potential. And so I was very um, thoughtful and strategic about what this position would look like uh, as we thought about how to take advantage of this opportunity at K2, but also solving that leadership um, issue, if you will. And so this person, we did already post the position as an anticipated opening. Um, just so that we could have access to the most highly qualified candidates. We're looking for an experienced leader who could come in and take on this dual role. Um, it's not really the type of position or um, opportunity for a novice leader. And so um, this position will be realized through the realignment that you see here. So we have some projected savings from retirement. Um, of course, then the retiring principal, or assistant principal rather, and eliminating one of our second grade um, classroom positions just due to projected enrollment numbers. So a quick question, if I'm looking at the green sheet here, um, why is that a new FTE if you're replacing a retiring position? The position that we're replacing is an assistant principal and this brings back a principal position. So it has, I think it's just cleaner to code it that way and more transparent to code it that way, even though we're realigning the resources of that existing position to make this a possibility. Are you looking at the blue side? Looking at the green side. I'm looking at the top one, replace retiring assistant principal. It, this is where I'm confused because it's bracketed like it's a negative, but it says total realigned FTE 7.5. So are we, we're not adding, I'm trying to determine, are we adding a position here or are we just replacing a, an assistant principal with a new position that has a different job re responsibility but we're not adding new staff? Right, it's right. a net zero. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Actually, it's a minus one because we're re re removing a teacher as well. Okay. But to the point, I'm a bit confused. Are, are the, the values shown on this in the front parentheses, are they? They're minuses. Okay, so those are savings. Those are um, reductions. What, so, what so if you flip it over to the blue side, it probably makes more sense because then you're seeing those two FTEs that are in brackets. That's what we're using to offset the additional the FTE that you're Thank you. Okay. So green is showing the savings yep. and blue is showing how, where you're realigning Where those. we're using them. So yep. after the realignment, you're asking for $296,000 in new investments. That's the net impact of this, right? The no. total of the blue. And 4.8 FTEs. Yes? 
Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the total. Blue, blue side. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about, yeah. sorry, I'm talking about the total on the bottom. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So after all of these realignments, so if if we were to make all of these positions that you see on the realigned side, the green side, um, if we were to request them in new investments, it would be 7.5 additional FTEs, and it would be an additional $620,000 that we're asking for. Um, but we're not asking for that in new investments. We have realigned and reassessed our existing resources because what one of the things that you hear me talking a lot about is how the work has shifted and how the work has changed. And so um, through this budget process, we, we were really thoughtful around what is, what is the, the work that is taking up all of our time and what is the work that's not getting enough of our time and how, do, how, has, how have the positions changed over even just the last five years. Um, so we may have brought in that assistant principal three years ago with an expectation that that person was going to work in, in one particular way. What we've learned in the past three years is that's not meeting the needs of the district. So through our reassessment and through our reflection with our goals, we were able to really identify what worked about that position and what did not and how could we, rather than just continuing to do um, what we've always done with the resources that we have, really kind of shake everything up and say, what's the actual work that we need to do and then aligning the resources to the work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to just you know, go right to adding to the top. We wanted to be more strategic about what we already have. And I think it, it goes to the point that um, we talk a lot about level services, but level services for us doesn't mean that it's not a reflective process. It means that we look at what we're doing today. We want to maintain the same programs and services that we're providing this year, next year, but not necessarily in the same way. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what this kind of realignment looks to. So, so that brings me to a, to a, another question. And uh, pardon me if I'm skipping ahead a little bit. If I am, I'll I'll, I'll wait. Um, but I, I wanted to look at the high school on the blue side. Mm -hmm. um, when we spoke about the budget last year, um, we were instructed there's going to be some um, core changes in the high school, really, with scheduling, with alignment of staff, and and restructuring basically the whole thing from the top down. There's all kinds of other programmatic changes, I think, coming to the high school. Um, is that process not continuing, or is that process been reevaluated, or is, does this reflect a completion of that process? Because when last year when we talked, I think we had 6.4 or something like that, yeah. where we FTEs last year's budget that we approved with the understanding that we would probably need an additional, help me, I think it was three or four, there were at the high school. There were 3. five 5. last year, and yeah. then there were three, three point five to come. Right. Exactly for this year. Right. So uh, you're skipping ahead a little, but okay. I'm happy to talk about that now because it does kind of build the story back to how we came to the K2 solution and, and why we have this improvement strategist position that you're seeing. Um, so through the process that, that I've described and through our analysis of what, what are our needs, um, this definitely came up in conversation because I think the high school communicated a plan two years ago and thought that it was just going to be sort of lockstep, okay, now time for the next part of the plan, um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the process that, that we chose to undergo. And so when it came time for us to create that student-centered bu budget that I refer to as the innovation budget or the innovative budget, the high school had, um, was requesting like 7.4 FTEs, and part of it was the 3.5 that had been, you know, quote-unquote, promised in the two-year plan. Um, and through that, I said, um, I said to the high school principal and the high school leadership team, um, you have to go back and reassess your priorities because all of these things cannot be priorities. And when I'm looking at class enrollment, I'm seeing some class sizes that are 13, 11, 12, sometimes 15, sometimes 24, but consistently, I didn't see the need. I couldn't justify the need of us bringing on more classroom teachers. And um, through my short time here and the analysis that we've been doing, um, I did not think that that was the highest priority either. Um, however, I wanted to really, I wanted the high school to own their part of the budget. And so there was lots of kind of push and pull, if you will, through that process where we were reflecting on what did you think the needs were, but what are the needs today and how do we shift? Um, and so from that process, what emerged um, are the requests that you see here, which are very different. Two of the requests that you see on this list here weren't on the initial request of 7.4 FTEs. 
Um, and that really came through us talking about not only what are our needs today, but what's the work that we have ahead of us in transitioning to a proficiency-based education system, but then also the future of Maine. How do we create a high school culture and opportunities for our high school students that allows us to contribute to the overall economic development of Maine? Um, and so we know that the IT jobs um, are growing at a rapid pace, that there's a high demand in that field. And one of the things I um, was talking with the high school leadership team about was how do we create more career academies in the Scarborough High School so that students have more opportunities um, outside of just traditional classroom, ex classroom experiences. And that's where you see this added internship and academy coordinator position. One of the other things um, I also discovered in my newness and asking lots of questions of everyone was that um, there are standards in Maine called career, and career education development standards, and we had not yet um, we have not yet unpacked them, uh, which means we have not yet aligned our curriculum to those standards. Although we have some good work that's happening at all phase levels, that's a K-12 expectation that um, we aren't yet positioned to meet. And so I feel that this internship and academy coordinator position you see here is absolutely critical for us to be able to do that work. The, the, the requirements you just mentioned, mm -hmm. are those state requirements? Yes. And are those funded re state requirements? No. And are, how, when, when were those introduced? Oh, I don't know, the, I, several years ago. So I want to say 2014. Okay. Um, but don't quote me on the exact year of that. And so what this position allows us to do is also implement our brand new or our uh, changing and evolving proficiency-based graduation requirements, which the um, policy that we're working with the school board on proposes that there are workplace experiences for students, such as internships, um, job shadow, um, can't think of some of the other ones. Um, also bringing in people from industry into the classroom to enhance the curriculum that we're currently offering. And so this person in year one, although they would be focusing on the high school, it, they'd also be taking a K-12 perspective. So we're um, positioning it here at the high school kind of as a triage to help us develop an internship course that will be offered in, that we would hope to offer in the spring of 2018, but then also allow us to engage in a year of planning um, to develop an IT career academy that would launch in 1819. And um, we're hoping to partner with NAF, which is the National Academy Foundation, in order to do that work. And part of the, and in order to partner with them, there is, um, there's like a $12,000 startup fee. And I'm working with some of our industry partners to try to have that creatively funded so you don't see that here in the budget. Um, we think that we can build some really strategic partnerships with our industry partners and um, create much of a give-get sort of relationship that we're going to ensure that we're um, feeding the pipeline into industry. Again, going back to that whole idea of how do we contribute to the economic development in Maine while also creating really unique opportunities for our students. And that work would be impossible without this position. How does that tie into the vocational schools? Aren't they doing that already? They do do that. So in Scarborough, we have um, a few we have very few students who access the vocational technical schools, tabs in Westbrook. And so what we're trying to do is create a more customizable high school education so that you still have the opportunity um, to engage with tabs in Westbrook and have that on-site CTE experience. But this creates a CTE experience within our four walls so our students don't have to leave. And the idea is that you would have a cohort of 20 students that would be selected or would self-select um, and really be marketed and recruited almost um, in their freshman year, and then they would enter the cohort in their sophomore year. And part of um, partnering with math gives them very um, specific hiring preferences with some major industry partners not all, um, nationally, not just here in Maine. So that's a really unique opportunity that we would be able to bring to our students while also meeting those standard requirements for career and education development. Um, so that position obviously has not been posted yet, but it's one that I would hope to be able to post soon in an at least in an anticipated way because I think it's a unique skill set that we would be looking for. And in year one, the primary goal of this person in this position would be 
Number one, building relationships with our industry partners, um, which takes a lot of nurturing and, and networking, as all of you know. Number two would be developing and teaching that internship course that I mentioned for two, um, for two sections in the spring. And the third thing would be engaging in that year of planning so that we could offer, um, I believe we would be the first district in Maine to be partnering with a National Academy Foundation to create an experience like that within our high school. And some other things that this person would be exploring would be the bridge program. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, I think it originated in Bangor, and I believe Gorham is the first uh, district in our area to offer the bridge program, which is kind of a hybrid of both what ex the experiences that students have at Pass and Westbrook and what we're talking about with these career academies in Scarborough High School. So that's what that position is about. Um, I think it really allows us to be future ready. I think it allows us to be innovative and it allows us to retain some of our students that currently are leaving us when they get to the high school grades to go um, to other places to get a more STEM uh, oriented focus. So, and the idea would be that after we launch one academy in 1819 and we partner with NAS to do that, um, then we could replicate that in other ways and maybe possibly be able to offer a fine arts academy or a business academy um, or a health and human services academy, essentially. So it's kind of reinventing what, what you and I think of when we think of the high school. Um, the other position that emerged at the high school as, an, as the number one priority is the 912 improvement strategist. This is a position that currently exists at the high school last year, um, Catherine Ruby was brought in. We just rebranded it to have a more um, systemic focus and approach, again, going back to like what the solution was for that K2 principal. And the primary roles of the improvement strategist, as I said before, is going to really build teacher capacity. Um, so they will be engaged in that job embedded um, uh, job embedded sustainable professional development so that we're not just thinking about professional development occurring during late starts or in meetings that are held after school or on full in service days when the students aren't there, but that it's more um, on the job, just in time professional development. And one of their primary responsibilities in year one is to really um, develop that data culture that I was talking about so that when we're making decisions, we're making them based on evidence. Did you say that position that, already exists, though? So this position currently exists. It's a consultant <coughs> um, who was brought in and funded through a grant. And um, so it's a new investment here because that grant, the grant funding is not available. Although when you see down at the bottom there that 30000 of existing resources, we would offset the cost of that new investment using um, some grant funds that we would have available. Um, something that I, I've heard um, a lot in regard to that particular position from my colleagues is it goes back to the schedule question, Chris, and when, when we talked last year, you heard a lot from David about what an eight period of block schedule was going to look like and how different it is. And one of the things that um, Catherine's helped us with a lot this year is for teachers to actually think about what it means to teach in an eight block schedule. And it seems sort of silly. I mean, you teach today and you're going to teach tomorrow, so what's the big difference? But the way that they plan their lessons, the way that they chunk the content that they're um, delivering to the students, the way that they schedule the semester and the year um, is vastly different. And so that's one of the things that she's been working on with them right, um, right along this year and would you know, hopefully continue to do next year. And the other piece, of course, is trying to invent proficiency-based education at our level. And you know, that's just been an enormous amount of work that's been going on for three years now and really needs to keep going. Really yeah. 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 And um, what, to what Kate was saying about that block transitioning to the eight block rotating schedule, what, th what that means for teachers is they're now teaching for 75 minutes straight. And so that's where, you know, your traditional stand and lecture kind of um, approach we know isn't the best model to begin with, but it really doesn't work for 75 minutes straight. Um, so we're trying to really think about what is the professional learning that has to occur in order to make sure that we're maximizing the potential of that schedule change. And that also means that teachers are going to have longer preparation periods, so what are they doing during those preparation periods? Um, and we need somebody on site to be able to provide professional learning during those extended um, prep periods. 
So what I felt like I was hearing was it was almost instead of last year's vision, which was we need to sort of have enough teachers to fill the time of the students, this year they've narrowed it down to the point where they think they have enough staff to do that, but they don't necessarily have the skill set and the leadership to make it work. Um, the priority has shifted a little bit. Well, and I think under the original plan, it was to be able to offer more electives and more choice to students. And so um, my argument against that would be that before we start to offer more, we need to really enhance what we currently offer. Um, and so this is going to give us a year to see what courses do students enroll in, what are the class sizes, um, because if we continue to have class sizes of 13 at the high school, that was understandable this year and in a transition year because we had to bring on some staff in preparation for being able to offer the core courses and, and the elective students would need. Um, but next year it'll allow us to really collect some good data and then be able to come back with an evidence-based request as opposed to a, like a, a hypothesis kind of um, request. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing I would... Um, add to that improvement strategist position, the benefit that we have seen this year from having Catherine Ruby on our team and being able to work not only with the high school but with K-12 curriculum teams as we transition to proficiency-based, um, one of the, in the student-centered requests, I'm sure you saw that K-5 was like, we need a Catherine Ruby, and the middle school was like, we need a Catherine Ruby, and so, again, wanting to be able to hear what is it that we are saying we need and how can we do that in the most efficient way was really the strategy behind that. And then the point five substance abuse counselor, um, I think we all hear what's happening um, in our state and in our country around substance use. Um, and right now, for, us, for almost 1,000 students at the high school, we only have a half-time um, student assistance counselor. And so what we're proposing is to bring her on full-time so that we can do more preventative and proactive work. Um, she has lots of really great ideas um, and lots of tools and resources. We're just not using that position, the half-time position, to its potential. And I think that um, very quickly we will start to see a return on that investment by making that a full-time position. And then the point two librarian, again, um, we all know that the high school is going through a NEASC self-study this year. One of the things that um, is very clear is for a, a high school of 1,000 students, you need to have a full-time librarian, and we don't currently have a full-time librarian. The librarian is currently point eight at the high school and point two at the middle school. Um, and then their work is supplemented with ed tech support. And so what we're proposing is to keep that librarian full-time at, um, at the high school, so reallocating the point two from the middle school to the high school, and then um, through some other, when we talk about the middle school, you'll see through some other realignment, we would be able to bring that position in full-time at the middle school. They've never had a librarian, um, a full-time librarian at the middle school, and you have 715 kids there. So, and I, I think part of that, too, is really understanding what is, what is it that a librarian does today, um, it's not, you know, somebody who's helping you just find books. It's, as you see when you're in the Wentworth Learning Commons, that role has really transformed like many of our roles have in education, and it's more about helping students um, process information um, and to apply information, and so we're looking at developing, you know, maker spaces in all of our libraries and really getting um, students asking questions and finding answers to those questions. So it's but it's more of a media specialist role. They also play a key role in our, um, you know, internet and social media, you know, digital, digital citizenship, safety. digital safety work as well. So those are the investments at the high school. It ends up being <coughs> 0.4 FTEs as opposed to the, the 3.5 or the 7.4 that they were originally asking for. Um, and I think, it's a, I think it's really smart and it's a really good investment for us to ensure that um, we continue to move our high school forward. Any questions about the high school? I have a couple. So, um, I was trying to think. So based on the new model mm -hmm. uh, that you want to do with the academy approach, um, not knowing, my daughter went to a different school. She went to Cape Elizabeth, not by my choice, believe me. But um, what other schools are out there are actually doing this academy approach? Um, you don't really hear too much about that in other districts. 
Well, um, a lot of other schools have a position like this that coordinates internships and mentoring programs for students. Um, for example, at Wentworth, we have um, some of our ed techs through their professional learning team work have developed a proposal to create a mentoring program. Um, and they brought in uh, someone from South Portland. She's been working in South Portland in this capacity, I think, for 15 years, I think she said. Um, and so it's her and one other woman that coordinate their workplace experiences for the district. We currently don't have a person who's devoted to doing that. And so um, they've, that's been a part of their practice for years. Um, in terms of us creating this academy approach within our high school, I don't know. Um, I don't know many districts in Maine that are currently doing it um, just yet, but I know that it's that CTE is one of the, the commissioner's goals, is to really bring more career technical education opportunities to students. And so part of that is changing the stigma around what CTE is, so that more students will take advantage of PATHS and Westbrook. Um, but that's always at a cost, because students then have to leave their schools to go be a part of a different learning community. And so we want to be able to promote that same thing, because we see the need and we know that it, it, there's a demand. Um, and we have students who would and should be taking advantage of that, but just don't want to leave their school, their home school to do that. So again, it gets down to this like customizable education, and it's all about fit, right? So just like when you're choosing your career, just like when you're choosing where you're going to live, you're, you're making all of these decisions based on what's the right fit for you, your personality, your personal needs, your family structure, all of that. It's the same idea with our students. So it's really a different way of treating our students and really thinking about what, what does this thing called education look like for you. As a okay. follow-up, um, and this is more of a qualitative, but it has a longer range quantitative piece that I want to add to it. So after a year of uh, taking anecdotal data, um, what if at the end of the year it says that it's not working? What happens? If at the end of the year what's not working, the Career Academy? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I don't believe that that would happen, and that would be why I would want to partner with the National Academy Foundation, because honestly, we would be lucky and fortunate if they even partner with us. Uh, my first conversation with them was kind of like, oh, well, you know, we don't want to get your hopes up. We're not really, in, we're not in Maine yet. You have to have at least 20 students who would be interested in IT and would want to be a part of the cohort. And uh, you know, I was a little offended by that, and I was explaining to her where we are in Scarborough and what, you know, the industry partners that we have access to and um, the opportunities that Maine is trying to create for students. And I think that it was a bit of education for them, um, and they weren't thinking about Maine in that way as a potential partner. But they are very, um, they're, they're very uh, popular in, I don't know if popular is the right word, but they're working with a lot of schools in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and New Hampshire. And so, so in your experience, on a long-range basis, so what I'm, what I'm really driving to is what is the cost of change? So being our new superintendent, um, I have a great deal of respect for you coming in, you know, um, knees deep into, the, into trying to um, influence the community, and I think it's a great move. But what is the long range? Because we're looking at this situation with today's budget mm -hmm. um, over probably two year period, at least two years, if not three. So what will be the longer range impact of that? What have you seen in, in the other communities that you saw in Massachusetts? Did you see that um, cost related to these type of program changes go up, um, you know, 3% a year? Did it go up 20%? Does it have a big spike and then level off? What well, happens? So my um, multiple reason why I would select an IT academy first, number one, I believe that we can do it basically with the existing resources that we have. It's just a matter of helping students connect the dots between our current course offerings so that they can see this pathway towards career and certification, and also they can end up graduating with, a, with math track certification, which gives them preferential hiring. Um, and a lot of our, a lot of uh, IT industry partners are looking to take, stu to bring students on right out of high school. Part of the program is that they have to have 120 hours of a paid internship throughout the three years. Um, and the idea is that some of these, some of our industry partners were learning want to grab these students right out of high school and grow them as employees and also support their college beyond, their, you know, their education beyond into college. And so I think it just it opens a door for our students and honestly I feel like we're kind of late to the party about this um, when it comes to thinking about the different types of opportunities that we can create for kids. 
So um, it might feel, it feels maybe different thinking about the career academy piece of it, but the workplace experiences, we have to be doing that. Um, we have to be creating that opportunity, and I think the only reason, it's not because we don't have good ideas about what that can look like. Um, we have a really robust community business partnership um, <coughs> that's basically chomping at the bit, saying to us, like, give us a focal point, show us, show us how we can help support the schools because they want to be an active participant in how we're growing our learners in a new and different way. And um, the, the, only, the only thing that's been holding us back is, is that there's no one who can focus on it because everyone else's plates are, are so full just trying to manage all of the other shifts that are happening. It brings up an interesting question though because your proficiency-based diplomas, mm -hmm. everything I've heard in the past is they're very time consuming and that, that's one of the reasons why we were going to an eight block schedule because we're gonna need to show proficiency in a multitude of different areas. Mm -hmm. How are you going to partner that proficiency-based requirement graduation with this additional 120 plus hours of paid internship and all these additional courses that you're going to have in this academy? So they're going to need to get a high school diploma, I would assume, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to need to have this certification in addition to that. Where's the time going to come from and what kind of, how do you foresee that working out together? Sure. So the paid internship is something that would happen outside of the, the school day. Mm -hmm. um, they're not getting paid while they're in school. While they're in school, their job is to demonstrate proficiency and earn credit. But part of this transition to a proficiency-based system is that it's, it's kind of breaking down the, the, department, the department model. So like I go to math to learn math, I go to science to learn science, I do my reading and writing over here in ELA. And what you see are more integrated approaches to a cross-curricular, content, if you will, or a learning experience is the actual language. And so it's not like you have to have so many hours or even so many credits of math or science or ELA in the new law. It talks about students having a, um, a learning experience in the four core areas, math, ELA, science, and social studies, each year that they're enrolled in high school. Um, and so that's a complete paradigm shift from what we experienced because it was all about the number of breaths you took while in your classroom. Um, and that's not what proficiency-based education is about. It's about high-quality, rigorous, relevant learning experiences. So an internship, um, an internship course like the one that we want to launch in the spring 2018 would be offered to just juniors and seniors, but that could count for a learning experience across multiple content areas so that the work that they're doing is aligned to the standards. And so that's what's different about a proficiency-based diploma is that you're proving that you have proficient knowledge of very specific standards. And the standards are very clear what students have to know and be able to do. I wasn't so much concerned about the, the internship part of it, but if you're getting an additional certificate, let's say in programming, mm -hmm. okay, so that when you're more desirable when you come out of high school to work for a IT, uh, an IT company. How, how do you, how, how are you going to manage that with the addition? Because I assume you have to have uh, demonstrated, you have to demonstrate the knowledge in those proficiency areas. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I don't want to get into the weeds of it too much. It's not our business to really yeah. do that. I, I'm just, I'm trying to get a, an idea of the vision of how there's a lot of moving pieces here. And if we're going to make an investment like this, how, how is that going to interact? Is it, is it going to mesh? with what we're trying to do traditionally, or is this going to be Absolutely. in addition to, or? No, I think it's, it, it's, a direct, it's directly in line with what we're already trying to do and need to do and are required to do with proficiency-based education. It just, it, it kind of takes that question that we all asked when we were sitting in class, when am I ever going to learn this, and crumbles it up and throws it out the window because everything is very, very relevant to, you know, what you might actually be interested in doing. Um, and. So the, the whole certification part is that's the alignment of the curriculum so that if you're taking a technology course and there's an opportunity, we already do this with, for some of our students, and there's an opportunity within that course for you to be earning a, a certification that you could take right into the workplace, that's already something that we've been thinking about. Um, and so the only thing that's really new about this Career Academy approach is that we would be partnering with um, a national partner who has done this successfully and hundreds of districts, and they're going to basically guide us through this work, making sure that we're successful because they won't invest with us even unless we, unless we prove to them that we can be successful. Um, 
and then it's just another it's another slice of that table I keep like waving my arms around and creating. So for some kids, this will be a really good fit. For you know those 20 students who are in that first IT academy, um, it'll be it'll be something that they didn't that might get them out of bed in the morning, that will help them build another social network, that will help them see the why behind their education. And I think in the interest of, I think we have about like 10 minutes. <laughs> um, question, but, but different, kind of maybe taking it to kind of a different level or different context and going way back up to 30,000 miles mm -hmm. to you. Um, the budget we're facing is pretty challenging. Everybody's seen the numbers, we know where we are. Um, we had committed or we had talked about collectively as, as a town wanting to come in at around 3%. Yeah. We're a long way away from 3% collectively. Um, and it looks like this year, you know, there's, you know, there was a new teacher's contract that's driving the payroll number line and healthcare. Good, good news on healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess our challenge would be, is this the year, because I, I think if we looked ahead last year, we started to look ahead, but I, I think as, as, as Sean has just described, we're probably looking at these types of numbers for the next two years, mm -hmm. if not three years. Yeah. So is this really, you know, if you guys have think about it, is this really the year you've invested in salaries and getting teachers competitive pay, but 4.8 FDEs, you know, when most businesses face revenue shortfalls, and revenue losses, they start to think about, okay, we're going to have a hiring freeze, we're going to make do with what we have. Um, we have some challenges, and as a community, we have choices. So I, this is a great conversation, and I look at a, a you know, one whole position, full-time equivalent for, app, you, know, app, you know, activities and then athletics. Um, that's just something to think about. The, the other question I'd like to ask very quickly, because we are going to be looking for money. I know you and I have gone back and forth for a couple years. Do you have any, you know, every year we talk about your funding, your budget, and we usually end up with surpluses? We do. And the surpluses have averaged three to $500,000 per year? Yes. So it might be, do you have any sense of where this year is going to be? And you, there must be a way that you're building in some unknowns. And if some of those cushions, have they come out of the budget that's in front of us so we're closer to what we really think it's going to be? Because those numbers, you know, five hundred thousand dollars is taxpayers' money that paid in. You know, they they're looking at out of their pocket quite a bit of money this year. We need to find a way that we're as, as good as we are with the numbers that that we can. So it's just it's just a question of thought. So rounds two, three as we go through this. Mm. Um, I, I have a couple of thoughts, um, sort of in response and sort of circling around what you're saying. Um, Obviously, we've, we've had this kind of conversation a lot before, and we'll have it a lot again because it's critical. And I, I think one of the things I want to say is, um, yes, we do typically have a 300 to $500,000 surplus at the end of, this, of the year. Yeah. Um, I have to make my little statement that we are not allowed to spend any more than what the voters approve for us, so that we have to come in under budget. And three hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollars on a forty five million dollar budget is actually a pretty good margin um, in terms of guessing what it is that you're going to spend with the volatility that we know is likely to happen in the course of a school year so in in our defense, um, you know we're not trying to take taxpayer money and stash it but it is something that we reflect on every year as we go through this budget building process and it's, it goes to what I said earlier about level services. When we say level services, we don't just say, I had $5,000 this year, I want $5,000 next year. We go line by line, we figure out you know, what did we spend this year, where are we likely to land at the end of the year, can we shrink that, do we need to add to it, and you know, literally every discretionary spending line gets that same type of reflection. Um, then going to where are we going to land at the end of fiscal 17, that's something that I'm going to be working on in the next couple of weeks because I think it's going to be helpful to us to know where we want to land in terms of using existing fund balance as revenue. Yeah, 
Yeah. So in the in um, the interest of time, perhaps I mean this was more of a reporting out session to where we're at, the snapshot yeah. in right now. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of joint budget meetings that we're going right. to be uh, joint finance meetings that we're going to be working through. Um, there's a lot of things in motion. There's a lot of things on the table. I think we have to look at fund balance utilization for sure. Yeah. We've got to look at uh, shifting things that we talked about from operational into into CIP or back again. So a lot of moving pieces. So I think those I, I'd, I'd like to. You know, think, you know, have that thought process for the next joint budget session where we have a, a, a list yeah. of mechanisms that we can explore and to what extent, what's the consequences of doing right. one or the other, how much, and, and how do we utilize all of the different tools and resources we have to try and close that gap of what our goal is with where we're at right now. Right, where are the decision points. And right. Um, I would just want to say one other thing that came up um, in, into my mind, and I have some notes in front of me about it because I was thinking about it earlier today, is that the impact of the collective bargaining agreement for the teachers, I've listed at the top of our list of major budget cost drivers because it's $920,000. But I do want to be clear that it's not an outrageously different cost increase year to year than we're, we had in our last collective bargaining agreement. Yes, we have moved the needle a little bit in terms of what we're paying our folks and you know, deliberately so, but I was looking back at uh, Julie's presentation from October and the difference between what we spent in fiscal 13 and fiscal 14 was an increase of 4.45% and 14 to 15 was 4.3 percent and 15 to 16 was 4.31 percent and so now we're looking at next year's projection is 4.45 percent so it's not as though suddenly we're, we're doing a six percent jump right. um, and I do want to make sure that my putting that lump sum number out there doesn't sort of make folks think that <laughs> it's um, more unusual than it actually is. I, but I also think it, it doesn't obviate your point, Chris. No, but I think the fair thing is, is the 800-pound gorilla in the room is we lost 1.4 million dollars in funding. We got to bridge the gap somehow. Yeah. And, and that's really where we're. I mean, it's not. I don't. I don't think it's. You know, the the proposals that are here for the educational side of things, I'm sure, are well justified and well documented and well founded. The question I think we're struggling with is. Is, you know, like we do every year. Is How this the right for year for this? Yeah. How much can we do? Yeah. How much can we put off? Yeah. Um, and we've really got to look at, and, and, and I think, you know, on both sides. We're doing it on the town side as yeah. well. Um, but, I do, but I also think we have to look at all of the mechanisms we have in place first because I'd be hesitant to say we've got one thing that we can fix and the budget's going to be solved. We've got a lot of complex things that we have to address and we have to take into account the next couple of years as well of, you know, is this stuff that we're going to be doing sustainable or is it a short one-term fix just to try and close a gap that we have? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think all of those things are, are, are certainly on the table. I, I'd like to see that at the, at the joint committee. We can really start getting into the weeds of, of that stuff. And, and so before we um, leave and somebody else comes on board, we do have to look at the timing of our next joint meeting. Um, it's planned for April 27th. Yeah, so and it's um, it, it's a sort of an accident of the calendar when we sat down with Tom and and the um, our legal advisors about the way the charter and the statute and um, the the legal parameters around the timing of all the different elements of the budget from first reading to public hearing to vote. That's how the calendar timed out, but it is unfortunate that we're not really going to be able to actually do a lot of digging in and figuring out until the very night that we're supposed to be, or the day that we're supposed to be voting. And that's not to say that the school board's second reading and vote isn't then going to be worked on after that because there's a lot more process yet to come, but it would be kind of cool if we could, if we could come to a closer number before the school board's second reading. I don't know if we decide that now. Well, I, I mean, I, I, the 20th, I've got two other commitments, yeah. but I, I mean, but it depends on when we when we schedule and dates and times and that kind of stuff. But um, so it could be maybe that week rather than, yeah. Right. So the 19th yeah. or 20th, if you could, because we sort of have to coordinate that and like last week. 
21st. How did that happen? 21st is Friday. I know. I'm School vacation week next week. Well, and uh, yeah, school vacation week is why we're not having a school board meeting next week. So. Yeah, I'll call you tomorrow. Well, some people aren't going to be on vacation, so. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Thanks for reminding the rest of us to meet. Yeah. yeah. So while we think about that, I just have two points that I would want to make in closing. Um, one, Peter, you made the comment that, you know, most businesses when seeing a $1.4 um, million dollar decrease in their revenue wouldn't be making any new investments. And I would just have to caution us to thinking about education as being most businesses. We're talking about building our future. And I don't mean to sound like overly dramatic about it, but I am, you know, passionate about this when I say this. And I worry that taking a year off just creates a bigger gap. And the other point I would make is that when you're looking at this contract and you're feeling like this is such a big raise for our teachers, it's because we were trying to fill a gap from years of not staying competitive. And even still, we're on the low end. You know, I know some people think that this contract makes our teachers the highest paid in the area. That's not accurate. They're not in the middle. They're still on the lower end. Um, and some of the contracts that we used in this analysis they were in negotiations at the time that we were trying to catch up to them. So that means if mm -hmm. I were to go back and reanalyze, that gap still exists. So I caution us against not continuing to invest in education. We are literally building our future one person at a time. And so I think that we owe it to our kids who are here now to be continually improving and growing. <coughs> and um, I am the first person to say that doesn't me always mean more. Um, but this budget that I have prepared for you is, is thoroughly scrubbed. Um, I'm committed to going back and doing the work that we need to do over the next few weeks to find even more efficiencies. Um, but I, I think that uh, the investments that are listed here in this mission critical budget are what, what our kids need in order to make sure that we're giving them the education that they deserve. We'll leave that alone for now. <laughs> Thank you. Strength in numbers, is that what you're thinking? Psalm 47, page 52. Let us That's pray. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Nancy Kroll, Library Director. I have Bill Honorado, our Board Treasurer, and Ginny Ketch, Emily Reed, our, our President of the Board, and Ann Summers, a fairly new addition to our Board. Very pleased to have them all here tonight. Thank you. And I'm going to be doing the presentation essentially with support. And uh, obviously would be glad to entertain questions tonight. I um, think for the purposes of your work tonight, my instructions are essentially to take a high level view that you've got lots of detail in front of you. Um, I may reference it from time to time, but essentially I'm going to give you kind of the, the gloss over quick um, salient points of where the increases are and, and what's driving that. Uh, the infographics on that first wonderful colorful page uh, give a quick review of some of the activity we've cultivated on behalf of the community and one of the examples I like to point out is the programming statistics because it's a really wonderful example of the way we leverage our investment for this community. We have done lots with partnerships and grants, uh, our thanks to the Friends of the Library, 
Uh, we have a $1,000 budget right now for our programming, and as a result of that really wonderful opportunity to cultivate from the community, we've had uh, 550 programs, attendance of over 11,000 people, and in addition to that, our meeting space is used by other organizations as well. So it's really a very busy place. The uh, drivers, primary drivers for our budget are the, uh, the payroll. And although you're on tab four, I think the, the details obviously are in your later tab, but I'll uh, mention briefly what those drivers uh, result from. We are, as part of the town's pay plan, although our employees are employees of the nonprofit corporation, we do conform to the same pay scales that the town's employees um, have. As a result, we do have a, a COLA that results from the same COLA that the other employees are receiving, so it's a 2.1 COLA. We also use the same STEP uh, program. The salary adjustment line includes a merit increase for just a few of the selected employees who have, through review process, um, been deemed to re um, el be eligible for that. And then the, uh, the one line that I did ask to please uh, keep in the budget um, is the new hours line, which is a line representing an existing person. I won't, uh, we don't talk names, we talk positions. Um, it's an assistant adult services reference position that we've been trying to make full time. From a full time to a full, uh, to, uh, from a part time to a full time position. We've been trying for a number of years. We peak up the, the hours, uh, but we don't go to the full time because the benefits part becomes such a large percentage of the increase. So I'm before you once again to please um, encourage funding of that position to a full 40 hour position so that position is eligible for the benefits package. What you see represented in that line is only three hours, but it includes the additional cost of a benefits package, which does include retirement and medical costs. So how much, how much is that? Uh, it's, uh, let me run to that page. That is um, $9,478. Where, where are you, Nancy? That sorry. begins, I'm sorry, I, I went to tab 10, okay. page 29. It's the line the, item detail? It's the detail. Okay. Um, and that position, um, understanding this, the climate we're in, I did reduce it to start in September. So this number represents approximately 10 months, 9 to 10 months of, of position. Uh, again, only three hours additional, but it does rep represent the additional cost of benefits. So that's the so that's the total nine thousand. That's total the total of the additional three hours and the benefits together in that one line. Uh, so that is the um, the one area that I'm most um, passionate about right now because we've been working so many years to accomplish that. There is a full time excuse me there is a a professional librarian in that position at this time, um, and. Um, we are eager to give that person the compensation they deserve. The health insurance is budgeted at a 15% increase. We do use Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust. Uh, we are in a different uh, pool than the town employees are. I was gratified to hear what the school department just received for their potential increase. But we don't get our number until late in the year. So we don't have any way of offering you um, assurance that it's not going to be that high. Our typical experience uh, in the pool that we're in is that we are typically far below that level of increase. I hope that's true this year, but because we heard this from Maine Municipal Association, typically they don't cry wolf unless they have something behind their, their numbers. So I took them at their word and did budget the 15% increase beginning January 1st. So that's reflected in the health insurance. Collections and information systems, um, we have realigned our budget, and again, I'm still on your detail in tab 10 because I think that's the area that shows up most successfully. The, the um, nearly to the last line, there's an information systems line is reduced by $10,000. Um, again, I'm on page 29 of your tab 10. <laughs> um, that is not a reduction in our overall budget. That's a reassignment of licenses that over time had been 
paid for from our information systems budget. We are now moving those costs up into the electronic resources line. So that line shows an $11,200 increase. That is simply realigning the existing resources. There's no additional resources there. We have pulled a little money out of the, uh, the non-book resources and then 10000 out of the IT budget and put it into the electronic resources. That will reflect those resources that are benefiting the public as opposed to software that's benefiting employees in their work day. So we, we felt that putting them all together in one line as opposed to distributing them gives us a better um, story about how we're supporting the community and our electronic resources. So again, those numbers are big numbers, but they're a wash. Um, the uh, income line is uh, more income this year. I'm happy to be able to at least do that for you. Uh, we did that as a result of increasing what we will attempt to raise as part of our annual appeal each year. The community is very generous this year. Its goal has been $47,000, and we expect we're going to make that. So next year we're going to challenge ourselves to raise 50000 And it's, um, in a, a budget of this size, 3000 doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it means a lot. It's representing um, outreach from the community and support from our community. So we're pleased to be able to do that. And then we've added additional revenue from our investment interest income. We do have a spending policy that sets the percentage of interest that we will apply to our operations, and we are going to cap that um, pretty strongly this year to be able to supplement the income. And then I also wanted to mention that um, I did, um, as a result of the request from the manager, my original request had been reduced by almost $5,000. So this has already been, um, as we've called it, washed once already. Um, we did make reductions. Um, and then I would, I'll stop just for a moment here on the operation because the bigger story is actually in our capital improvements mm -hmm. line. Is there anything else in operating that I can share with you or explain? Just the, the three hours, Nancy, is that, I mean, we tend to try and think in FTE equivalent. Mm -hmm. is, are, are what, where, where are you at with that we right have now? Is that like six, a point? We have six full-time employees right now, but we have about almost 14 FTEs. We have 21 employees altogether. Six of those are full-time. So this will take us to seven full-time and the rest will be part-time still. So, so, we'll be so what would the, what will, if you could just kind of couch it, what's the increase in FTE? Is it a 0.3 increase? Oh, it's or? even less than that because okay. only three hours is, I'm going to say we might be 14.1. Okay. It'll be a very small impact on the FTEs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I can get you that actual number. I've got it. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions on the operating side? Okay. I, I will turn to capital projects. We, we do not have any capital equipment. Um, over tab 7, excuse me, tab 7, uh, page 11. Thank you. Uh, over the years, we've been encouraged uh, to move our equipment, CIP, into our operating budget. And for the first time this year, we can report that everything on our um, equipment side is in our operating budget. So as a re result, we didn't have to bring anything forward on that budget. But we do have some significant items in the uh, project CIP. Uh, the first is a parking lot ceiling, which we did defer from last year. We've been able to defer that by doing some crack ceiling over the last year or so, and uh, that's kept it fairly stable. The parking lot was installed in October 2010. Uh, so it will be 17 or 18 <coughs> years old at the point we actually get this work done. It has not been sealed at all since that time. The uh, HVAC maintenance is a result of several bids that we've received. Uh, our humidifier is included in this line. Our humidifier uh, sadly burst a few months ago. It's located in the ceiling, yeah. which caused That's some pleasing. damage. Yeah. and it's over some pretty um, valuable collections. So we are very concerned about uh, that repair. Uh, humidification in a library is important because of the paper that we have. Although we're not an archive, it still does help sustain the, the health of the paper product. Technology um, to a point certainly benefits because it reduces static, and without a doubt, our staff has noticed that our air is very dry and we've had a lot more respiratory uh, concern as a result of not having that humidification. <coughs> so we are um, certainly very concerned about that and want to have that repaired. 
It is a scheduled maintenance to a point. Uh, there is a, a drain that does get clogged over time. There's a condensation issue. But they're going to replace it with a different kind of product that hopefully will hold up more than five to ten years. Uh, it's going to go into a plastic pipe as opposed to a cast iron pipe. So there's a, a real strategy there. Uh, the solar panel project is actually a project that we were prepared to move forward on last fall and bring it to you as a council. Uh, this is a power purchase ag agreement with Revision Energy to put panels on two faces of the library roof. It will supplement the power usage. It won't uh, completely replace the power usage of the library. Uh, and it was delayed because we realized we were going to have a sustainability coordinator on board. And we felt it was important for that person to have uh, a good perspective on what we were proposing. Uh, we did have the support and help from the town's energy committee. Uh, and our Board of Trustees has fully endorsed this. So we had delayed the project uh, so that we could bring it to you as part of the budget process as opposed to bringing it as a separate request earlier in the year. The uh, power purchase agreement is similar to engine six. I can't remember which engine. The, the, there's one of the fire departments that already uses this, this process. Uh, obviously, we have solar panels on other municipal buildings, and we're very excited about not only what it will do for um, our power usage, but also the opportunity to have an educational component within the community. I know this town is very pro-energy sustainability and um, <coughs> demonstrations, so we're really excited about this prospect. And again, we wanted to be sure and bring it through the budget process as, as opposed to bringing it out as a separate project. Yeah, but it says this is a <coughs> upfront. Mm -hmm. Energy premium prepayment. Yeah. What, is, what does that mean? I'll give you the, the paperwork. I'm not going to even presume that I can use the language appropriately. So I, I would offer you that we can bring our sustainability coordinator to a, one of your workshops. Um, she has offered to do so and make sure that we get the language in an appropriate <laughs> order. <laughs> So, so two, two quick questions. Um, is this rooftop solar or is it, it going to be next to the thing? Okay, so yep. the educational component will be more with the monitoring of the system, not necessarily. Yes, we will have a kiosk um, on the ground floor where people can actually see what's being created and what the offset is. And um, actually, the uh, uh, it, main indoor carding has such a unit, and I was able to see how that operates. It's really very, very nice to see and refreshing just to have that educational component as well. And, and have you done an ROI in terms of mm -hmm. when the what the payout is going yeah, to be? Six to seven year okay. period. We've got the thirty year chart. We can yep. give you all the pennies. Okay. <laughs> yep. We, we need the pennies. I believe the difference with this uh, business relationship is that we've the, the town its two installations for solar um, has had no upfront costs, but there's a future cost uh, right. to, to buy it out, if you will. It's mm -hmm. agreed upon residual, mm -hmm. if you will. So we've deferred that decision until some point in the future. I, I don't recall whether that is. This has um, the library pay, prepaying that premium. Unloaded. I suspect they won't have that option, uh, but they do have locked in rates under the PPA for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so you can calculate the ROI, uh, at least over that lifetime. Mm -hmm. are, are we, Ms. Uh, Moore, for the manager, uh, are we at a point with these individual projects that we're better off trying to negotiate a bigger contract or renegotiate a larger contract or are we better doing it kind of piecemeal? Um, I, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. I, uh, the typical model revision has been using uh, really is building by building. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say they aren't working with other communities on larger uh, installations. Um, South Portland, I think, is considering a vast, almost commercial scale array at their landfill. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that has entirely different business components associated. Um, I'm just thinking maybe for the community service building or whatever we're looking at for the, you know, if that's something to look at incorporating. It doesn't necessarily, if that's something mm -hmm. that we could piggyback off of, right. you know, with, with future contracts. I don't know if revision would be open to doing that or if maybe it doesn't make sense because of the volume we have, I don't know. The Energy Committee is uh, very active, very interested in these sorts of things, and now we have some staff horsepower, so I, I think those sorts of conversations will continue. And uh, for those who are familiar with the, um, the <coughs> process as a commercial enterprise and, and rebates and that sort of thing, the library is a nonprofit corporation, so we don't have the tax advantages, which is why this kind of an agreement is more attractive for our particular organizational structure. 
So we will get you some more information. Thank you. <laughs> the reader board is uh, simply a change out of the panels that are on our electronic reader board out by this, this roadside on Gorham Road. That was installed in August of 2009. We've replaced the panels numerous times, and as I drove in this morning, I noticed there's another panel going. So this is a matter of just technology refresh that occurs when you deal with technology. Um, so that is what's represented on that line. Nancy, if I could just yes, make a, a larger point. Just uh, This is in front of the, the committee at this point. Please note the, the, the A that's affixed to each of those. Uh, we're proposing to appropriate funds as opposed to finance uh, by any means. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some choices that you can make in that regard. Some of those projects arguably could be financed over a period of time. Solar panels have a life of 30 years. So um, we're trying to be true to what we've mm -hmm. all been talking about mm -hmm. for a number of years. Um, and this is a good example. So I just thought I'd, mm -hmm. I'd use this one as, uh, to point that out to you. But that's a, a point that we can and should revisit uh, in your whole process. Uh, I might mention also that that reader board is used not only for library events, but um, we're very good about including other community events on that. And it's also uh, programmable remotely, so if we need to program it for an emergency message of some sort, we're able to do that as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. finally, the big one, the building mm -hmm. expansion project, although it's not the last on the list, it's the one that we're uh, really okay. very engaged in right now. Um, the manager did uh, move the uh, request from my request of 2018 to uh, what he felt was a more likely 2019 time frame based on the final budget. But um, I've had a chance to describe what our intent is for this next year, and it's, it's really intended to be planning. We have a lot of work ahead of us uh, that's <coughs> somewhat different than a municipal building in that we have to do fundraising. And that's going to require us to do a lot of upfront uh, not only design um, and, and community-wide study, but we have to have some real important prospecting work done as well. By prospecting, I mean donors. We do anticipate having a, a significant fundraising component to the project before <coughs> it goes too far, and um, that will help uh, determine what fiscal year it actually comes to what we presume will be a bond request through the, the town. Uh, there are a number of scenarios down the road that we can use. Uh, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg prospect here. Do we have a bond pass before we raise money or do we raise money before a bond? And there may be a compromise there as well. But the fact is we have to have a, a real review of what our current conditions are, what our needs are, and what the community's interests are before we put any uh, design out there and then before we approach donors or potential large grants. When, when you provided the tour of the library, uh, for me we talked about the archival component, potential archival component. Are you still possibly pursuing that or is that That will be part of the conversation we okay. have to have as part of our studies. We have, um, there are other kinds of um, ideas like that floating in the community okay. and we need to be sure whatever it is that we design is what the community is prepared to support. Okay. Is that 5.5, um, that's all in before we know anything as far as no, we, Yeah, sources? we have no idea what that yeah, number is going to be. It's a, it's a guess. Okay. And yeah. it was yeah. based on some square footage analysis from other building projects sure. in the last yeah. five years. We got some square footage and did a quick multiplication <laughs> and then yeah. came up with that. Mm -hmm. And it's not that far from what our earlier project was, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean it's going to be the same project at all. But we need to obviously have a placeholder for you. Nancy, do you have a sense of what the capacity of the community is to support? Uh, what sort of fundraising might you might be a reasonable target? Um, excellent question that I don't have an, an excellent answer for. I can tell you that the last <coughs> round we attempted a $1.2 million fundraising and we were unsuccessful. That was a number of years ago. Since this, that time, we've worked very, very hard, and I think um, we've done a good job of um, revisiting our involvement in the community and our position in the community, I think we're in a, a much, much better place than we were. And at that time, we didn't have a culture of giving within the community. We didn't have an annual fund. People didn't have an understanding of the, the library's mm -hmm. needs. And I think, um, although it was disappointing to lose a referendum that many years ago, in fact, it's given us a lot of opportunity to talk about what, what we do and how we do it and what it means to the community. So hopefully, a million dollars is 
a slam dunk, but we won't. Part of the study, in quotes, is a feasibility study by a professional fundraising consultant. And they actually go into the community and talk to some potential major donors and get a sense of, of what those folks feel the capacity is in the community. Yeah, and I'll take responsibility. I, I, looking at the long range facility plan and knowing what else is in our pipeline, um, public safety building being the big one right in front of us, um, practically speaking, I don't see this going out to the voters. I would not recommend it anyhow until there's enough kind of time and separation and more importantly for the library to build a strong case and, and justify itself on its own. Uh, what I hadn't considered is the whole fundraising component and how impactful that could be for this project. That's not typically a, a viable option for projects that we're bonding, but I think there is a very clear and uh, loyal following and support of the library that um, we had hoped and expect would, would step forward. So that, that was a piece that I had not considered. Mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> I, I, it does. And I, I'd be interested to, to hear what the consultant's thoughts are on fundraising first versus bonding secondary mm -hmm. or bonding first versus fundraising secondary because, you know, if there's, if, and, and how, you know, the benefits of doing one versus the other. Uh, because I think if we, it may be easier, more easily digestible if we have a, already have a pool of money and we're just supplementing it to complete it versus, or I, I don't know, I'm, I'm and curious to know how that they, will how be they a question that. that the right. consultant can um, ask as part of their interview process. And I will tell you that there's no one right answer. Every community chooses a different path. Some have right. done where they do a bond in anticipation of raising a certain goal. Yep. They don't release bonds until it happens. So yep. there's certainly some, some protective uh, language that can be included. It's a good idea. It's advisory, typically. So should you choose to, to meet the request and, and move this funding back into fiscal year 18, which is what's being asked of you, I would recommend that that would be a, an item that could be bonded um, as part of a, a project. It doesn't have to be, but that, uh, in my estimation, would certainly be something that would qualify. And I'll just quickly mention the two last items just so because they are in the pipeline for next year. The security cameras are to update what's currently um, non-existent as well as replace the few that are in existent and um, more importantly to include it as part of the entire campus network of uh, security so that if uh, somebody is suddenly out of camera range because they've gone down the driveway toward the library, we've still got them identified as part of a, a larger issue. So that's, uh, that will be something I'll be working with um, police as well as school um, facilities management to address what that might look like. And then finally the emergency generator, which has over the years become Nancy's generator. Um, <laughs> that will continue to be a passion of mine, but I'm, uh, I'm a realist. That's been on them for several years. Yeah, and exactly. Longer than has. the FTE that you want. Right. <laughs> it has been, you're right. Um, but we continue to leave it there. Um, I continue to seek out grants. It's a little more difficult to get uh, grants for this kind of infrastructure. Years ago, FEMA was a lot more generous in their um, infrastructure grants than they are now, but um, it's there because we care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, anybody? anybody? All set. I'm good. I'm good. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Um, I guess next on the agenda, we just had general budget discussion. Are there any items that percolate for either one of you that you want to suggest? Or you just want to ping me? Um, we've mentioned fund balance. We've mentioned maybe a forward adjustment. I don't know. Any, maybe just ping me. Or we can yeah, I mean, work. yeah, yeah. I, 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 the biggest thing for me is, like I said, I'd like to get an agenda together earlier about the, the joint finance with the schools because I think that's, that's going to be a heavy lifting meeting. Yep. Okay. I guess to close out, there's some dates, future dates and times, but uh, we're running kind of on time. Are there any public comment? Anybody want to have anything to say this evening? Oh, it's quiet. So I want to say something. Oh, okay. now, now that I think about this, sorry. No, so um, as we go through this process, and one of the things I would like us to consider is whether or not there might be a couple of presentations that could still be further consolidated so that we can have that general, more of a policy-driven discussion. Um, um, and the reason why I'm focusing on the policy is because we have one budget and I hope that these policies become a focus across all departments regardless of where the funding has gone. Second is that, um, so this really kind of kicks off the budget and I just want to my fellow counselors as well as staff as well as citizens is that we should be mindful 
of the words that we use in talking about or describing our conversations because, you know, um, those words are often picked up very quickly when you talk about um, not investing in schools or not investing in technology or not investing or cuts or, you know, there's different language and lingo that can really harm a communication process. So I hope that we're very careful about that and that we're uh, um, trying to describe it um, maybe more passionately or more, uh, you know, calmly. That's all I had to say. It, it does sound as though there's uh, a lot of area for discussion with your colleagues on the school side, and I don't disagree that those joint meetings is probably a great venue for that to, to occur. Um, we might have two opportunities between now and um, when this, the schedule suggests that uh, it will be moving along. If there's a meeting next week, we really ought to be finding as soon as tomorrow that figuring that date out. So if there's anything um, we can do to help support you, make sure you pass a date by us to make sure that the facilities are available. That's oftentimes our biggest constraint. So mm -hmm. um, I think staff will make themselves available daytime, evening, whatever suits your needs. I, I think we should. Thursday doesn't work from what I know about everyone's schedule. It seems like Wednesday would have to be the date. Or Friday. Or Friday. And this is next week? Yes. Right, so and, wait, maybe and, maybe what we can do, Peter, is, is have two or three dates yeah. and times and present them to the to, to the, the school board finance. Let them kind of try and settle in, settle on one or something. I know it's difficult on your schedule, but daytime yeah. meetings is a lot easier to schedule in these chambers. Uh, re do recall you have council meeting Wednesday, so that's not likely an option for you. But after normal business hours, yeah, it doesn't work for. I, I, my hang up on Thursday, I have a PAX meeting on Thursday at 3. Okay, Friday's wide open. Friday's wide open for me. I can be totally flexible on Friday. Um, uh, Monday, and, uh, Monday and Tuesday, I could be totally flexible as well. So, really, Wednesday and Thursday are the worst days for me, unfortunately. Chris, I, I may be able to get you coverage on the PAX commitment, if that helps. So, uh, Peter, I'm, pl I'm pleased to work with you tomorrow to see if we can lock down a date and time. Yeah. Great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? <laughs> He's on vacation already. I know. <laughs> the car's already left.